I want to tell you one short uh, story that'll kind of frame things. When Terry and I worked together at Oregon State, uh, I, uh, we, we worked on a number of strategic projects. And I realized after a while that my staff, I don't know about the engineering staff, would kind of troll my calendar. When they found out Terry and I were having a meeting, they'd all sort of sit there waiting to see what came out of that meeting. And I'd have a line of people in my office when I came back saying, all right, what happened? What do we do next? <laughs> I laugh about that because, um, you know, Bud, uh, Bud talked about this uh, uh, being done in the last 60 days. I could make an argument that what we're going to be talking about here today, and certainly what I want to tee up, uh, could have started, we could argue that it started more than 40 years ago. The Cooperative Institute series that Walid is the director of here on campus uh, actually has existed longer than NOAA has existed. It's our, not only the largest cooperative institute in our portfolio, but it is also the longest standing cooperative institute. And so it has demonstrated the effectiveness of taking products, environmental products, and, and bringing them to utilization and to market in a variety of different ways. Or you could argue that this whole thing started over, over a fried eggs at breakfast yeah. a few months ago as well. So the important thing is that my, I, I tip my hat to all of you here to the university for taking the initiative and moving out on having what I think is absolutely a critical discussion. And I say that because, yes, I'm from NOAA, but I want you to focus on this part of the logo. NOAA's part of the Department of Commerce. Bad on us if we're not taking these concepts and thinking about them, not just in terms of safety and environmental stewardship, but also in terms of commercial development, new business development. It's actually kind of an interesting side note that NOAA is the largest bureau within the Department of Commerce by far. Commerce is about an eight, eight or nine billion dollar agency, and we're about a five or six billion dollar uh, bureau and invariably whenever a new commerce secretary comes in they're stunned to find out that most of their time will be associated with managing fish forecasting the weather and surveying the coasts among <laughs> other things <laughs> and we're very fortunate right now I should point out Penny Pritzker is the Secretary of Commerce uh, she has she's a real visionary and she really gets many of these ideas and she is a friend of NOAA that was not a, that's not always been true with respect to the secretaries of commerce so we have this window of opportunity here at NOAA to think about issues like what more can we do with existing resources capacity data facilities partnerships and then where are the emerging opportunities and that's what I'd like to try to tee up here so um, Anybody got a nickel? Let's go. Can I have a nickel? <laughs> My kid took it this morning. She <laughs> gave me four pennies. Somebody's got to have a nickel. <laughs> Nobody's got a nickel? Thank you. Appreciate it. You have just doubled your contribution you. to the acquisition of data and delivery of products by NOAA <laughs> for today. Okay, so in fact, yeah, ham-handed as that demonstration is, I want you to keep in mind that it is costing every American citizen only five cents a day to get the kind of products and services that I'm talking about here. So talk about leveraging that in terms of a real incredible return on investment. And that's how we want to try to pitch this. So let me jump right in and share with you First, you can have your nickel back. <laughs> I don't want give it, it I don't want it it to publicly out. advertised that a political appointee took a nickel from someone <laughs> at a meeting in Boulder. Um, I, I want to set a context because a lot of people don't necessarily know what NOAA is all about. Um, many of us think of the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms or no organization at all. Uh, NOAA has this rich and diverse mission portfolio. And it's captured here in terms of uh, not everything we do, but a lot of what we do. And we talk about having responsibility from the surface of the sun for uh, basically dealing with uh, solar storms and space weather, down to the bottom of the ocean, mapping and charting and habitat, fisheries habitat. Um, and the other important thing to realize with NOAA is that we have both a product and service responsibility, but we also have uh, a few regulatory responsibilities. So we do regulate marine fisheries. We also regulate coastal zone management. Uh, but most of what we do is in the provision of 
environmental information and services in these kinds of areas. And in fact, what we've started to do is talk about what we engage in in terms of environmental intelligence. And those of you who work within the intelligence community or are contractors to the intel community, you know that there is not one kind of intelligence. There's human, there's Mazint, there's SIGINT, there's a variety of different kinds of intelligence. Environmental intelligence is the same sort of thing. It's the idea of delivering timely, accurate, and reliable products for decision support. In our case, the sweet spot for us, I would argue, is not necessarily so much in the acquisition of just the data regarding the here and now, but it's in the development of fundamental predictions and projections, nowcast, forecast, hindcast, for a variety of different applications. To keep that timely, actionable, and reliable label in mind as I walk through the rest of these slides. When you talk about the concept of prediction, it begs the question over what kind of scales and for what kind of sectors and what kind of util utilization. This slide comes from the uh, product that just came out of the National Academy of Sciences uh, entitled Next Generation Earth System Prediction Strategies for Subseasonal to Seasonal Forecasts, S2S as we call it. And what you see here is that on decision time scales and across forecast lead times, there is a continuum from minutes out to, it says years, but I'd say decades and centuries as well. And the question then is, how do you focus on what products to develop? Well, it depends on what community you're talking to. Yesterday, I was in Chicago talking to the Water Environment Federation about their interest. It was just people who work in stormwater management. That's all it was. It was hundreds of people from every state in the nation. And, and interestingly, and I think it's, it's worth pointing this out, I was sharing this with Terry a minute ago. One guy at the end of my talk t popped up. He said, I work for a small company. You've never heard of us. He was right. I'd never heard of them. And he said, we use your uh, quantitative precipitation forecast to develop a uh, tailored product for each municipality so they know how to basically set up their storm drain system and the plumbing, if you will, the municipal plum plumbing. A really good example of how within this water, a, a subcomponent of the water resources sector, there is a market developing, there is a third party service provider, a value added service provider. I could spend the rest of the day walking through every one of these sectors talking about where those opportunities are. That is at the heart of what we're talking about here today. Market development, market assessment, emerging opportunities and utilization of the resources and capabilities as they exist right now. So let me talk about a few examples of what we might call data to decisions. We put out a drought monitor and in fact this one's interesting because it came out of legislation. It really was the Western, Western Governors Association a few years ago who said, hey, we got a problem here. We have this impending drought. We need to take a look at what the existing uh, data are and try to find a way of getting that out into a useful product. And so what's come out of this now is this U.S. drought monitor. Every week I get the bulletin, the drought monitor. This week, 15.4% of the lower 48 is in drought one through drought four conditions, affecting 49.5 million people. Actually, just like gripe I've got, the, the bulletin comes out and because it's sort of this mindless algorithm. What I get is that it says that this week, 49,578,312 people are affected by drought. I've told them, let's just make it 49.5 million. I think we get the point. But, but there's a message there, too, about being careful about how we use some of these data. So the, um, the value of seeing where we are in drought, the value of having some early warning systems built into this by regions is clearly recognized by a variety of different users. The Department of Agriculture, Energy, a variety of users use this. Let me point out also that, yeah, while I'm standing up here as an OA guy with my NOAA lapel pin, uh, many of these products you'll see are just identified as .gov. Uh, and that's because we are working with USGS, we are working with <coughs> USDA, we are working with the Bureau of Reclamation to try to make sure we're getting these products out. And in fact, the University of Nebraska is a key player in the development of this particular product. So there's one example. 
Emergency response imagery, we've got a number of imagery-based firms here in the room. This is a responsibility of groups like the National Geodetic Survey, which is part of NOAA's National Ocean Service. What you see here is some imagery post-Hurricane Sandy. Uh, real problem, obviously, and I should point out the imagery. Uh, well, up here we're, we're showing some of the areas that were surveyed post-storm. The imagery is not remotely, not all just airborne or satellite-based remote sensing. The imagery is also acoustic, uh, side scan, multi-beam data because the ability to bring the ships back into the harbor after a storm as severe as Superstorm Sandy is critical and if, if you don't know, the, if you can't do the change detection on where the shoals are in New York Harbor, for example, you got a real problem. So this is another example of bringing uh, rapid response, rapid analysis, but again, this is a function that we've got to do to support the fundamental mission if a particular harbor here, uh, that may be Hoboken, I don't my, know my geography all that well, if they say they want a tailored product, that's not something the federal government's going to do. And many of these places do want very specific tailored products. But we do have a responsibility for the foundational information. Uh, this is one that I'm really fond of. Uh, don't ask me to tell you what the acronym FACETS means. Oh, I, I will tell you what the acronym FACETS means. <laughs> Forgot we had that on there. So what it is, is basically taking the best meteorological modeling, numerical weather prediction, the best data acquisition and assimilation from our radars, our dual polarization, and soon our phased array radars, and coupling them with social, behavioral, and economic models. So here's the problem. Historically, we would put out a tornado warning and it would be a polygon. And basically it says if this foot is inside the polygon and that foot's outside the polygon, then you don't have to worry about getting by, hit by a tornado on your left side, not your right side. Obviously, we needed a probabilistic way of approaching this. But it turns out the probabilistic forecasting is not well understood by most user communities. So how do you build a product that is understandable and also is usable by different users in different ways? So the hospital administrator is going to have a different set of response protocols for a tornado warning than the high school principal or the stay-at-home parent. So what we're trying to do with this facets approach is build a probabilistic forecast capability in a way that allows the user to say, my threshold is 40% uh, probability within the next hour that I'm going to get hit with this uh, particular tornado. It, and this is important because the, the meteorological community, uh, to put it in perspective, the average lead time for a tornado warning 20 years ago was minus five minutes. Think about that. Minus five minutes. <laughs> Means we could tell you with great accuracy you were just hit by a tornado <laughs> in five minutes. That's now at about 15 minutes. The meteorological community believes we can get that up to 20 with a variety of different techniques and technologies. And they're saying if 15 is good, 20 is better, 30 would be great. Not necessarily. Because the behavioral scientists tell us the difference between 20 and 30 minutes is that that stay-at-home parent says, you know what, I got a little more time, I'm going to go out and get another quart of milk or pick up Johnny at school, and puts themselves in more danger than if they sheltered in place. So it's critical that we start thinking about coupling some of our physical science modeling capability, numer numerical weather prediction, and the associated data simulation that allows that with the behavioral models as well. So that one's an interesting development. The other a uh, concept to recognize here is we're starting to get into new markets, if you will, new applications. NOAA has had the Weather Bureau has been around for over 100 years. They've done forecasting. We do climate products. Uh, we obviously do fishery stock assessments. A few years back, we realized we have a capability across this seemingly disparate agency that includes the Satellite and Data Information Service, NESDIS, that includes the National Marine Fishery Service, the Weather Service, the Ocean Service. Some of these things actually require coordination. Some of these challenges we've got. Harmful algal blooms is a really good example. It turns out that with uh, traditional kinds of ocean color remote sensing, coupled with an understanding of 
uh, biological phenomena, uh, uh, trophic interactions, if you will, coupled with an understanding of the prevailing local winds, you can, for certain areas like the eastern Gulf of Mexico, develop a really good system that says this particular species of algae called Karenia brevis is going to bloom in the next three to five days. You've got prevailing winds that are going to blow any aerosols from that bloom to the east, and the aerosols from those blooms typically cause serious respiratory problems. So you couldn't do that with just an atmospheric model. You couldn't do it with just a biological model. You couldn't do it with just the weather observations. And we now have as an operational product for this part of the Gulf of Mexico a harmful algal bloom forecast. As you've been able to infer, the problem is you can't take that model and use it in New England or use it off the Pacific Northwest because it's different species, it's different uh, uh, atmospheric phenomena, but the concept is still the same. So here's where we're trying to take the, the richness of diversity in an agency like NOAA, say what other products might we be able to develop with this sort of approach. The Fisheries Independent Survey System, cleverly titled FINS, um, is another example of where we realized a few years ago, you know, for supporting fisheries management, we do a lot of data acquisition. We do a lot of oceanographic data acquisition. We do a lot of habitat observations using acoustic systems. We do a lot of counts of protected species, whales, marine mammals. Can we get those data in a place where the public can access them a little bit more readily? This actually came out of some of the integrated ocean observing system discussions where we said, hey, there's this whole vast data field that's being used to manage fisheries and coral reefs and that sort of thing. Can we build it into a, uh, uh, into a system for potentially applying to other problems. And, and this is an example, I would argue, of uh, collateral benefit of a data, uh, uh, data collection activity within NOAA. Don't know what the uh, 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 side benefits of this might be, but that's why we want to have these kinds of discussions. The other uh, interesting aspect is development of products that I would argue beg a clarity of public-private relationships. And many of you in the room know that we have a rich, not always completely uh, agreeable history of public-private relations and commercial weather services. And so one of the things to keep in mind, and the reason I say not always agreeable is because the expectations, the terms of reference weren't always clear. Who develops what products? Where does it become an issue of public competition with the private sector? So there's been a lot of good lessons learned, and I'm, my hat's off to the National Academy of Sciences, specifically the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climatology, because they have done a lot of studies on how you work across that uh, divide, if you will, in a, in a strong partnership manner. But with that as a, as a stage setter, I'll say another example of a product we've developed is this digital coast. How can you take the good predictions and projections that we have for sea level rise, for example, uh, be able to develop a web-based product which allows you to set, whoops, set toggles. Let's go back. Set toggles, uh, in this case, at a two-foot sea level rise, then start looking at meaningful things, combine them with topographic data, start looking at flood uh, frequency, uh, fold them in as we did with facets earlier with some of the social vulnerability issues. Does it really matter that you get flooding in this part of the Chesapeake Bay? Well, yeah, if you're, if you're a local community and that's where your most valuable uh, assets are and that's where your most vulnerable human resources are, yeah, that can have serious implications. So the ability to, to blend different data sets in a, in a web-based product and start pulling up this kind of information can be very useful. This is an expansion of that. The eNow Data Explorer within the digital coast context folds in some of the economic information as well. So what you see here, for example, is for Lincoln County, Oregon, by sector, by geography, a variety of different assessments on uh, critical facilities in the floodplain, for example. So you can start bringing in a lot of very interesting data. And this is also an advantage we have within the Department of Commerce, I'd argue, because the Census Bureau is within the Department of Commerce. So we can go over to the Census Bureau and say, hey, you know, what have you got? How can we, how can we commingle and conflate 
some of these data to get some particularly meaningful products here. And my question to a group like this is, what do you see as a potential market for expansions of these kinds of data? Let's talk a little bit about the social network side and, and the mobile services. This is just a, a quick screenshot of some of the kinds of applications that are out there. I had somebody ask me yesterday, they, they thought they had been cornered, they said, so what weather app have you got? What's your favorite weather app? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I got a lot of them. <laughs> and I do, I have a lot of them. Yes, I have the, the weather service apps. I also have Weather Channel. I have AccuWeather. I, because like any good environmental scientist, I want to do my own ensembling. <laughs> And I freely admit I apply a bias. When I want it to be sunny, I find the app that shows me it's going to be sunny. <laughs> um, but but uh, this is just one part of the, um, the mobile apps and social networking part of it. The other, of course, is the data acquisition side. Uh, probably in this room, I'm guessing we've got over 100 data acquisition systems in the form of iPhones or uh, uh, sophisticated wristwatches that can start pulling in pressure. Uh, information, temperature information, how are we using that in the most effective manner to, to and, and, and then of course deal with the QA, QC issues, but the crowdsourcing aspect of what we do has got to be part of the equation. So this of course leads into uh, a big data dialogue and I want to point out before I forget my colleague Ed Kern sitting here is going to be with you through tomorrow. You're going to hear, hopefully you're going to hear a lot of similarity and back and forth between <laughs> us here. Uh, Ed is really the data guy. Ed works in uh, the National Centers for Environmental Information in Nashville, North Carolina and is the acting director of our big data project. And so he's going to keep me honest here. But I wanted to give you from the uh, overall perspective some thoughts on how, why we're going down this road and, and what might be some of the opportunities and then look forward to the discussion over the rest of the day and really pursuing that line. So what you see here is the growth of NOAA's uh, data archive aggregate. We're going to be up uh, at about the 150 petabytes by 2030. Right now we're somewhere around 20 petabytes overall, uh, 20 terabytes per day on average. It shows you a breakout by sources. It's not shown here, but the purple is the satellite data broken out here by the different satellite uh, constellations. The geostationary, the polar orbiters, uh, obviously represents a large chunk. You'll see this green bar, um, the sudden increase here in fiscal year 2020. The green bar is modeling, and this basically is a reflection of our intent to start archiving the next generation uh, numerical weather prediction capability, the model that we will be using and putting that into the system. That represents a considerable uh, increase in the archive data. So the data are growing. Um, the satellite component uh, will always be a major aspect of this, but I want this audience to recognize that's not the only component. These others, if you don't know them, NEXRAD is the uh, ground-based radar systems, we've got the integrated ocean observing system, other geophysical data, and then we've got a whole range of atmospheric in situ observations, including taking observations from aircraft, commercial aircraft, as they take off and as they land. That's, a, that's an example of a public-private partnership we built years ago. The other side of the coin <clears throat> from our National Centers for Environmental Information is the user demand. Uh, the message here, of course, is look at the growth in terms of petabytes. Just a few years ago, we were less than a petabyte. Now we're up at around six. Again, you see the demand heavily weighted toward the satellite data here. Uh, some interesting statistics here, two and a half billion web hits in fiscal year 14 with 19 million users. That's before we even start thinking about making this kind of visibility here. Um, somewhat related, I don't think I get into too much of this. Um, in the talk, but I'll, I'll say it briefly before I talk about the big data project. The other interesting challenge is on the computational side. I think you know there is a national strategic computing initiative. That's the bureaucraties for exascale computing. NOAA is one of only six agencies that have been identified as deploying agencies. So the idea is that uh, other agencies, including NSF and obviously in the DOD and Intel community, are developing agencies, DOE clearly developing agencies, for exascale computing. DOE will be at 600 petaflops within three years. 
the user community, the deploying community, uh, includes, I want to make sure I've got this right, uh, Department of Homeland Security and FBI, read security, anti-terrorism, uh, the uh, Health and Human Services and NIH, read Brain Initiative, Curing Cancer, and NASA and NOAA, read Environmental Information, Climate Services. Here's my concern, that if we're not in the game big time from the start, those first two groups are going to marginalize the environmental information community, if you will. So part of my plea is to pay attention to what's happening in that uh, supercomputing world, in the exascale computing world. Um, we are, I had the opportunity to talk to Ernie Moniz, the Secretary of Energy, and thank him profusely for all that they have done with us, allowing us access to some of their high performance computing and hoping that we will have similar access. To put it in perspective right now, we are shouting with joy within NOAA because I think we hit six petaflops in January, something like that, between our operational and research computers. So we look with envy at what's happening over in DOE and hope that we can have some access to the computational cycles for some of the things we're talking about. Pardon me? Per day, petaflops per day. Petaflop computational capability. Per day? I don't know the answer to that. Any day, yeah, I, yeah. It's just the it's just the horsepower. Per second. Yeah, yeah. That, right. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Yes. The um, the the other uh, part of that equation is that uh, the whole storage part and the whole capability for taking advantage of developments in cloud computing is something that we have probably not taken adequate advantage of within NOAA, which is why over a year ago we started thinking about engaging in the big data project. And this captures very simplistically the, um, the concept. So in the past, the, the user would basically reach out to NCEI or some other part of NOAA and say, I need to get access to this information. Not always the easiest thing to do, uh, not always the most efficient thing to do. Our thinking was, can we start use, working with collaborators, those who are interested in developing an access, an access capability, be a little bit more nimble, uh, consider a variety of different business models, and let the large cloud providers think about how to work this new dynamic. So we put out the opportunity, five of the big cloud providers came back and said, we'd like to collaborate with you through the development of cooperative R&D agreements. They're shown here. Amigo is the abbreviation, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google, and the Open Cloud Consortium. They are our uh, partners, if you will, through collaboration on this. And we are now developing the concepts of operation. We're, we're Taking, advantages, uh, taking advantage of a few other considerations. Several years ago, through the uh, White House, the National Plan for Civil Earth Observations was developed. And one of the things that plan did was take a look at the national capability for Earth observations, and in fact identified those observational systems uh, in a ranked order with respect to impact on a variety of different sectors. And what you see here is uh, that product directly out of that report where the NEXRAD, which is our uh, weather radar, showed up second on the list uh, after the uh, GPS and then of course the GOES, the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite System, was number four on the list. Airborne LIDAR is down here. You can see these tell us that these are high priority, big potential impact, one could argue potential market development there as well. So as we've gone down the road over the last year, what we've seen is that there is a, an opportunity, a demand for these very products. Next right here goes the multi-radar, multi-sensor system. Uh, and then, of course, a range of numerical model products coming out. And we include those in the data portfolio as well. So these are where we're starting to focus our initial concepts. These data streams are where we're uh, focusing our initial concepts and give you some idea of the kinds of applications. Uh, the Climate Corporation, this, this is a precision agriculture application. The idea is from cab to cloud, from the tractor cab that may have the observations, ground uh, soil moisture, 
uh, a variety of different observations, can pull up data on the fly, send it into the cloud. There is a reanalysis capability then that can be done, and that reanalysis capability says, based on the years and years of soil moisture or other environmental data, here is what we think you can do to optimize, and based on your observations coupled into that data set, here is your recommendation for uh, irrigation, herbicides, pesticides, fertil uh, fertilization to have the optimal yield on your crop. You can't do this just by the observation. You can't do this just by making a prediction on current, uh, on current conditions. It's really assimilating the current data, doing a reanalysis based on decades of observations in a particular field, and then being able to come back and saying, here's how, here, here is how you optimize. Obviously, part of this is going back to the earlier slide that I showed in terms of the change of the concept of operations. The old way to do this large-scale analysis at the Climate Corporation involves the, the acquisition of data or the request for the data, the download, upload, validation, launch, compute. The idea here is can we short-circuit that system sh through, a, through an, uh, a, a public bucket, through a cloud service like this. I, I've skimmed over a number of the real challenges here in terms of how one goes from the left side to the right side. And there are some assumptions which I, I would argue we made originally in the development of the Big Data Project about, if you will, the knowledge base among the cloud providers as to how the data can be used and what needs to be done with the data to get them to a stage for third-party value, uh, third value uh, development. That's where we have some challenges right now, and I think Ed will probably say a lot more about that tomorrow. The, uh, it, uh, I want to make sure you understand from my comments that there really is a diversity of user communities. The reinsurance industry, as one example, yes, of course, we've, used, we've worked with them for years and years in risk analysis. Uh, we've worked with them in terms of uh, their redistribution of uh, risk models. The reinsurance industry, interestingly, about 20 years ago, was the largest funder of postdocs in the oceanographic community because they recognized what they were doing was they were not mitig necessarily mitigating their risk by distributing their assets in the Philippines and in East Africa. But the environmental community demonstrates to them you might actually be compounding your risks because you don't have adequate understanding of the environmental conditions. In this case, what we're looking at is, is a little bit more of forensics. So it's not unusual uh, in the insurance industry for people to make false claims about things like hail damage. And there has to be a way of going back and looking and reanalyzing based on historical data, climatology, not dissimilar to the example of precision agriculture I just cited where if the following conditions are in place in Norman, Oklahoma, and we can go back and reanalyze based on 30 years of multi-radar, multi-sensor observations, can we confirm that there probably was severe convective storms that would literally precipitate hail on this date at this time? It's an, a computationally intense determination, but it turns out that there's a lot of money to be saved in the reinsurance industry by determining what was a real claim and what was not a real claim. So that's another example. I want to talk a little bit in the closing minutes about what we see as some emerging opportunities, business opportunities. This is one that I'm uh, quite geared into, the new blue economy. So the story goes something like this. There are three blue, that is to say marine, economies. The first is the extant economy, oil and gas, fishing, commercial shipping. You can do that survey and count up how many oil rigs there are, how many people are employed, what the revenue is, what the costs are. You can do the same with all those industries. And people have done that. So we know what that extant blue economy looks like. The hidden blue economy is the second one. The example would be the electrical engineer who is working on the development of autonomous underwater vehicles specifically designed for the US Navy or for the oil and gas industry. That individual is actually working in the blue economy but tends to be categorized 
The same as an electrical engineer who's working in a semiconductor company in the Midwest that has nothing to do with marine applications. So we've spent a lot of time looking at what the, the hidden blue economy looks like. And it turns out by first estimate, a study we contracted out, that economy is about $7 billion in the US, that hidden blue economy. That's what the NFL is worth. So I'll put it in some context. So the hidden blue economy is, is the second category. The third, which is the one that I think we can focus on is this emerging blue economy. The economy that is not extractive, it doesn't depend, depend upon fish or minerals out of the ocean, it depends on pulling bits and bytes of information. And it is based on a predictive capability. The example I can cite for you is a guy named Mitch Roffer, who in Florida recognized that if he took all of the available data coming in through uh, then the National Ocean Data Center, uh, and other sources, uh, he could develop a uh, proprietary predictive system specific to the tournament fishing industry, which is actually a rather lucrative industry. And he now has a business model that says, I'm going to produce a product for you if you're marlin fishing or fishing for something else, and I can tell you where to go and how to fish, uh, what depth, what time, where it's going to be the best opportunity. And he's making pretty good, pretty good uh, profit on that. He's rather unique in the ocean industry. There are not a lot of people who are developing those products. There is, I would argue, a rich and extensive market for many of these kinds of applications uh, based on what is now a robust set of observations through the integrated ocean observing system. You can see from this list on the right, it's really diverse. It's traditional physical observations, it's biological observations, high frequency radar, we didn't have that 20 years ago, we do now and includes a whole set of emerging kinds of platforms like gliders and autonomous underwater vehicles. And the idea is that perhaps at some point the new blue economy would be providing futures for things like catastrophe bonds, ocean catastrophe bonds, and energy products, uh, siting and scaling, uh, marine hydrokinetic energy, wind farms, wave farms offshore is a uh, an emerging industry that could benefit from this kind of information. Ocean forecast, natural infrastructure management. Big issue right now is green infrastructure. Can you protect the ports and harbors around the country by building up the marshlands, by putting in oyster farms, by nourishing the beaches? The only way I know to be able to answer that if I'm a consultant is by accessing the data and developing my own predictive system that says, yes, if you nourish the beach in the following way, you will mitigate the impact of coastal storms in this area by X percent over the next 10 years. So we're looking towards a new blue future. This is the, the market analyses haven't been done. The capital is not evident for doing this right now. But my point is 20 years ago, we didn't have the ocean observations to even have this discussion. Now we do. So many, many challenges. Uh, I would argue they fall into a few categories. Uh, market assessment being one. Uh, where are the markets for these various products? Business models being the other. And that's part of what we're here to talk about. We can't tell you what the business model within the big data project should be. We're having a lot of discussions about what various other approaches might be. Um, and then I would argue uh, new market development, like the blue economy. Some of this can be driven by us without waiting for people like Mitch Roffer to come in and say, hey, I think I can make a buck selling predictive capabilities for this tournament fishing industry. So we have a whole range of challenges. We, not, not NOAA, not you all in the audience, we as a community asso and, uh, associated with the use of environmental intelligence. Um, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. I basically alluded to this. I think you all as business people understand this better than I. This relationship is one that we're looking at developing. Uh, it really means having a good understanding of what the end user community looks like. It, it, it means understanding what are the capabilities in this third party value added service providers. The problem with an audience like this is you are a very savvy audience. We can talk about NOAA products, we can talk about NEXRAD, we can talk about what the potential utility of imaging products is. Not necessarily always the case with other third party service divide, uh, providers that we're dealing with. Um, like I would say the reinsurance industry which falls somewhere in between this yellow and this green bubble. So 
Uh, let me close out by just saying that hopefully what I've been able to do is be a little bit provocative, share with you some of the thoughts about how we are proceeding in the development of the big uh, data project. Most importantly, share with you a conviction on our part to seriously engage with the private sector and define new business opportunities, figure out what the, the paradigm is for working with third-party service providers, the cloud providers, and define a way forward through some specific case studies and examples that I think we can flesh out here. And I'll stop there and hopefully we have some time for questions.